Okay, well, hello to everyone and welcome to the fourth annual Kundal Forum, which is sponsored by the Kundal History Prize, the Dean of Arts, and the Department of History and Classical Studies of McGill University. This is the second to last of the Kundal Festival events, uh, following on last night's excellent lecture by Marilyn Cars, which was delivered at the Faculty Club last night, and preceding the announcement of this year's winner at the award ceremony that will happen tonight that some of you will be attending. Uh, before I get started, I want to say a very quick thank you to Kate Deborah and Elizabeth Elborn for organizing things today and for their help with everything. And a big thank you to all of you for braving this very weird weather to get here. We've had hail, snow, sun, and rain since the day started. I also want to say thank you to those of you who are streaming in online on YouTube. Uh, I want to introduce myself really quickly. My name is Christy Ironside, and I'm an assistant professor of Russian history here at McGill University. Just a quick format uh, sort of reminder about this panel. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk about themes that are of public interest that have to do with the craft of history, history writing. And we're going to bring together our three finalists to give some comments about their projects and also about the, the practice of history more broadly, um, each of whom is a finalist, obviously, for the Kundal Prize that will be announced tonight. So this will be a structured discussion of about 40 minutes in length. And then there will be some time at the end, about 20 minutes for questions. So the theme of today's discussion is passionate histories, the historian and the politics of truth. Um, just to start off, this, this year's panelists, uh, they are experts in very different parts of the world. And I must admit, when I got their books, I thought, how am I going to pull this all together into one discussion? Because at first glance, you might think that there is absolutely nothing in common with the United States, Cuba, and the former Soviet Union, um, or that there wouldn't be very much points of convergence between them. Yet, if you look a little closer at all of them, you can see that they are each writing about historical phenomena that continue to resonate to the present day, whether that is the legacies of racism and slavery, uh, the legacies of colonization and conquest, or the legacies of an empire's collapse. Uh, put quite simply, all three are books that help us to understand the present and the past more clearly, and I would argue with more compassion. Um, so just to uh, introduce our panelists, I'm going to go from, uh, from my left to right here. Uh, Taya Miles is the Michael Garvey Professor of History and Radcliffe Alumni Professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study of Harvard University. She is the author of All That She Carried, The Journey of Ashley Sack, A Black Family Keepsake. Ada Ferrer is the Julius Silver Professor of History and Latin American and Caribbean Studies at New York University and the author of Cuba and American History. Vladislav Zubok is Professor of International History at the London School of Economics and the author of Collapse, the Fall of the Soviet Union. So these are our three panelists. So just to kick things off, um, all of your books feature a very strong personal connection to the subject matter at hand. This is something that you address in the opening pages uh, almost right away in all of your books. Taya talks about an important uh, piece of family lore, how her grandmother's sister miraculously saved a cow as they were being evicted from their farm in Mississippi, and how this saved them from ruin as they fled the South. Uh, in the opening paragraph, Ada describes her book as deeply personal and relays the story of how she and her mother emigrated to America, when she was a small child, uh, to join her father and her mother left behind sons from a previous marriage. Uh, meanwhile, the first couple of sentences in Vlad's book talk about how he learned about the attempted coup to depose Gorbachev in August 1991 while he was sitting on an Aeroflot flight bound for New York where he was about to begin a fellowship. Since the Themes Forum this year is Passionate Histories, I wanted to start by giving you a few minutes to elaborate on why you decided to write these books. Were these stories that you always wanted to tell or were they sort of spurred on by other events or forces in your lives? So maybe I'll start with Taya since I introduced you first. Okay, and thank you very much, Christy, for that introduction and for structuring our conversation this afternoon. I am so happy that you ended that question with, or were the books spurred by something else? Because I definitely fall into that category. I did not expect to write my book, All That She Carried. And in fact, I keep a list of all the books that I hope to write uh, over the course of um, the days that I may have on this earth. And next up was going to be a book about African-Americans in the West, looking at the families of a group known as Buffalo Soldiers. And I had been sort of steadily making my way across the country in terms of the book projects that I chose. So I'd already done um, four books based on the US South. And I did a book on the Midwest. And I was looking west when I had the opportunity to see the object that is the centerpiece of my book. And it's an antique cotton sack 
from um, South Carolina on the southeastern coast of the U.S., which tells the story of a family of enslaved black women. And so I had to actually disrupt my plans to work on this book. I thought for some reason <laughs> that I could write this book uh, rather quickly. I thought I would write a short book about the sack and then move back to my planned schedule <laughs> of books. But the topic was just absolutely absorbing and the project was actually much more difficult than I anticipated and so it ended up taking about five years. Well, thank you all for being here. And I'll just say to Taya, five years is very fast for a historian. So <laughs> I think it's impressive. It's true. Um, I think I'm somewhere in between. I, I think in some ways, I always imagined writing a history of Cuba, from not always when I was 15, but always after I became a historian, I imagined doing something like that. But at the same time, it was something that I wasn't initially that interested in doing, actually. I didn't think it would be um, exciting to write, and I always kept getting drawn in by other topics. But then a few things happened. I had finished two other books related to the history of Cuba. Mm -hmm. uh, the first was on the 19th century wars of independence and the role of slavery and race in that struggle. And then the second book was about the impact of the Haitian Revolution in Cuba. So it was a book that was uh, about Cuba, but seeing Cuba in Haiti's mirror, as, as Haiti's mirror, right. in a sense. And then I had to decide what to do next. And so I did what I love to do best, which is to go to archives. So I went to the archive in Madrid. I went to the archive in Sevilla. I went to the archive in Havana. And I kept finding amazing documents and thinking, well, this would be good if I wanted to write a project on X or a project on Y. But I just couldn't figure out what that project was. And then in the midst of that, Obama opened up, Obama and Raul Castro announced the normalization of relations. And so I thought it was a new moment, a moment of re-encounter after more than 50 years between these two countries and these two people. And so I thought that the moment required a new kind of history, uh, you know, a history that covered a long sweep of time, but that also allowed people to see each other maybe in different ways a story, a, his, a kind of history where Americans, North Americans, U.S. Ians, might see themselves refracted through the eyes of another. Uh, and also a kind of history where Cubans might look back on their, his, on their own history through the eyes of each other with less rancor and less polarization and less division. Then, of course, you know, we can never predict what happens, and Trump was elected, and that path was the path of reconciliation was abandoned. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. <laughs> Glad. Okay. Well, fantastic opportunity to address so many people on the subject of something that no longer exists, the <laughs> Soviet Union. Well, uh, but I lived my life there, and it was not not particularly unhappy life, I should say. Uh, so uh, since that time, I moved to the West. I began to write books, and uh, I guess to date it back to '91 when I f first thought, you know, I hear all kinds of comments about why the Soviet Union collapsed, but I, they don't convince me, and I'm confused. So I remain confused for almost 20 years until I decided I should put an end to this confusion. Because meanwhile, I produced books on the Cold War, and they kind of bumped into the end of the Cold War as an obstacle because most of the authors on the Cold War, and they say, oh, the Cold War ended, the Berlin Wall collapsed. And by the way, the, the, then the Soviet Union collapsed as well. <laughs> Boom, the, the end of the story. So I found it kind of slightly upsetting. Uh, I also wrote a couple of books about Russian intellectuals, about their life, how they suffered under Stalin, how they hoped uh, under Khrushchev, you know, how they got bored under Brezhnev. And then the Soviet Union collapsed. So you know, the Soviet Union collapse was kind of you know, an obstacle that always stood in the way that somehow should be either removed or explained. And this is 
why I began to do it, and uh, it, it took a life of its own, as always. You know, I spent 10 years of my life on this, uh, but doing other things, of course, like all of us, uh, teaching and, and, and writing other things. But, but then, you know, when I was finishing the book, I told some people here in the, in the audience, I realized, hey, you know, Ukraine is sort of becoming a, a place of trouble. So if you, if you ever get to the end of my book, four, page, four, four chapters of last chapters of my book are imbued with this concern about Russian-Ukrainian war. So it was unfortunately the premonition that turned out to be true. Just as a follow-up question for all of you, and you can answer in whatever order you want to this time, what are some of the challenges involved in writing topics that are deeply personal, as Ada puts it? How do you write yourself in or know when to take yourself out of the narrative? And how do you sort of navigate maybe personally troubling terrain? Does anyone want to pitch in? Sure. So, in, in my, since you mentioned yeah. my name, in in my case, the book, you know, the book is a, on one level, is just a well, not just. It's a history of Cuba over five hundred years. It doesn't sound like a deeply personal topic. It sounds like the opposite, right? <laughs> but, but I felt like it would be a, it would be disingenuous and a disservice to the reader to not explain to them my very personal investment in this history. So I begin in the prologue just putting, or in the, in the introduction, the prologue I think it was, just um, saying that up front. Uh, I feel like in some sense my whole career has been you know, 30 years of digging through <laughs> Cuban and Spanish archives for you know, the, the, the drudgery of archival work, which, which I love day after day, day after day. But behind that is this effort to understand this place where I was born, but that I have no memory of because I left when I was so little. It's an effort to understand my parents' world, um, the world of grandparents I, I never knew, right? So I felt like it had to be put up front. And then throughout the book, what I ended up doing is there were moments where stories that I had heard became part of the evidence alongside all that archival work. So if I could just take the time to give one example. My mother and my aunt used to tell me this story when they were little about these um, two elderly people in their community, both African born. Their names were Irene and Genaro Lukumi. And they used to gather the students, I mean not the students, I'm in a university, the, the, you know, the young children in the neighborhood and tell them stories. And he would tell stories about fighting in the final war of independence under a black general. And she, the woman would tell stories about purchasing her own freedom in the final days of slavery. And so part of all my work for that period is about linking the story of independence with the story of emancipation. And here's a very personal story that just illustrated it perfectly. So why wouldn't I include that, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so there were moments like that where, you know, and I think I, I, part of me always wanted to write, sorry, a, a book that my parents, people like my parents, might be able to see themselves in. Yeah. And I hadn't read anything like that, so mm -hmm. why not put them in? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Ty or Vlad? Well, I will jump in and just echo what Ada has said about transparency and about being straightforward with readers about where it is that we stand as scholars or writers in relation to our projects. I think it's important information uh, contextually for readers to know. When it comes to my book, I didn't think of it as a deeply personal book in terms of my own family for a long time. It was certainly personal because it was about African American women and enslavement. And I cared deeply about that population and about that history and about that past. And it feels very much like it is often with us in the present. But it wasn't about me. It was a project about these women who had lived their lives in um, very extreme circumstances and managed to convey care and love for one another you know, across generations and, and across uh, space and time, nevertheless. I didn't really write my own family history into the book until I already had a draft. And I was giving presentations about the material in progress, which is a really wonderful uh, way to work through material, I find, to, to share it and to be vulnerable with it and to get feedback and hear what people say. 
And I received feedback from people, especially in Africana Studies, about the parts of the presentation based on the book in progress that spoke the most to them. And they asked me if I would take the step, which actually felt like a risk, of writing more about spirituality. And they also asked me to write about my own family. I mean, they said, where is your family in all of this? Mm. That's when I went back and wrote a new introduction. Well, Chrissy posed an interesting question, how you, how you put yourself in the book and yet uh, take a distance from the book. And I think it's, it's part of our craft to do so because um, on one hand, you know, first, first pages of my book may be deceiving because I insolently put myself in front, you know, hear me sitting and flying and doing something. Uh, you know, the rest of the book is not like this. Uh, the rest of the book is more back to my Soviet upbringing. Don't stick out your neck, you know. <laughs> Be objective. Follow the Marxist-Leninist structural analysis. No, 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 no not, not all this. I followed, of course. But uh, indeed, uh, I was there. I was there through perestroika. I, I uh, was passionately involved in all this. I organized uh, discussions of uh, na na Nazi-Soviet pact. Uh, with the, the KGB agents sitting in the room. I mean, I can tell, you know, talk a lot about this. But then that I didn't want to describe because I knew this would be my story and people like myself, a very segmented group. What I really wanted, I wanted to learn the rest about, well, to the best of my abilities to learn the rest about that enormity of the collapse of a country, the Communist Party, the state, and so on and so forth. So I privileged actually other stories, even the stories that I never before wanted to privilege, so-called hardliners, you know, going into the stories of so-called reactionaries whom I passionately had hated uh, 30 years ago. I mean, what was their motivation? The coup leaders, why they didn't use force, and so on and so forth. And that was unusually uh, difficult, mm -hmm. I should say, because you have to s kind of step step over certain prejudices. And this is in part why I'm saying it's good that I wrote it 30 years later and not uh, 20 or 15 years later, because I guess time, time is, uh, is a wonderful med uh, you know, ma medicine. Not for everyone, but uh, historians definitely benefit from, from this. You could not have provided a better segue to my next question, actually, uh, which is about an ongoing discussion that a lot of historians are, are having of late about the sort of benefits and disadvantages of a very presentist outlook, that is, you know, writing the past, interpreting the past through the values and concerns of the present. Um, I'd love to hear the panel's thoughts on this. Uh, how much should historians and history books relate to present day concerns? And, uh, and maybe putting the question a little bit differently, how do the news or sort of the things that are happening around you just affect you, your research, and your writing? Dead silence. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I don't know. Since, yeah. since I, I gave you a prompt, I Christy. Gave you, I mean, gave you <laughs> Right, you gave me a prompt, whatever. Yeah. Uh, um, well, I keep thinking about the, the first historians that, that we remember, Plutarch, Thucydides, and others. Why are we still reading them at all? Because, uh, you know, they reflected passionately sometimes uh, the interests of their time. People continue to read them. As a result, those works continue to be copied by hand and passed to us. So that, that would be... Um, it's almost essential to address the public in one way or another, even if, if you sit somewhere very high inside the ivory tower. And I think uh, I would contradict myself a little bit. I said I tried to pull myself out of the book, but let's say I failed uh, in some way. And in some way, I decided this is my book after all. I should not be that Marxist, Leninist, or whoever, whatever objective. I don't believe in objectivity. I'm a human being. And uh, it, it was, in a sense, uh, a combination of both things, your, your own emotions, your, your own vantage point. I maybe delude myself when I say, you know, 30 years helped me to take this huge distance. 
that I, I, I don't say like most of my countrymen that Gorbachev was a traitor and, uh, and a destroyer of, of, of the great state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it also helped that they lived in, 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 on the other side of the world, in the United States and, and, and England. So distance in every sense is, is, is healthy and salutary, but at the same time, I don't, I don't believe that anyone can uh, remove oneself totally from what, you know, from history especially. Just th th your comment about thir thir it's good to have had 30 years to write about it. I remember one time walking in New York City on the way to the New York Public Library as I was working on this book, and I suddenly thought to myself, I want to live to be 97. Mm. Because if I live to be 97, that will be the 100th year anniversary of the Cuban Revolution, and maybe by then I will understand it. <laughs> so, anyway, um, so I do think that di you know that distance is good, but I, but I also think that that the present always, or almost always, no, always impacts what people are interested in. It's, yeah. it's, it's unavoidable. Yeah. And that's a, that's a good thing. I mean, if you think about the, you know, the, the, the field, say, of environmental history and how important it's become, does, is some of that due to you know, people's correct and growing concerns about, about, the, about the planet, right? So it, it's, I feel like it's, it's unavoidable. At the same time, I don't think that historians should go out of their way to force a connection to the present when it's not there. Yeah. So rather than, you know, than state an absolute rule, historians should or shouldn't. I think it varies a lot by, by topic, by what the historian's trying to achieve, but that inevitably the, the present impacts us all. It's, it's, it's where we are, it's where we think from, it's where we see from. I, I agree with all that's been said, Christy, and I think the example of standing on a street in New York City in a present moment in time, thinking about a past event and how you wanted to understand it better in the future yeah. encapsulates the complexity of what history means for us as human beings. I mean, history has an expansive time horizon for us, and I think it's not just natural and expected, but I think that it's important for us to recognize that and for us not to pretend that history is only in the past somewhere and doesn't affect us today. I also am never really sure what is being charged when someone says, aha, presentism. <laughs> so, excuse me for pointing in that direction. I, no, it's not, not told you. Um, I don't know if, if what is being charged is that the person has used the values or politics of the present to understand the past, or if the person is connecting past events and motivations to present day issues. I think that the first relationship between our work and the present is one that we need to be very careful with. I don't think that we should look at the past as, as if it's today, because it's not. But the past affects today excuse me, the past affects today, and I think that we should be using whatever skills we have or whatever knowledge we have to bring it into the public square to help us think about our current circumstances. Uh, so the sub-theme of this is the politics of truth, and of course, uh, you know, no better place for politics is social media, popular media, so maybe I'll take the discussion a little bit in that direction. Um, more historians than ever before maintain very visible online presences and often disseminate their research in this way. I wanted to ask you if you think that this amplification of historians' work and historiographical debates via social and popular media is a good thing, in your opinion. Uh, how does it affect history writing when we can reach more people than ever before through various forms of media, but there are also more people than ever before who can weigh in on our arguments and our professional disputes? Loaded question. <laughs> I'll jump in because I probably have the least to say about this. Um, <laughs> there are some people in the room who, who know that I am, I am just really, really negligent um, when it comes to my social media accounts. I hardly ever go there. I don't know what's going on there. I, I found out early on that in my own life, I couldn't maintain the intensity of keeping track of those accounts and those conversations. And also, quite frankly, I didn't really enjoy being in that space where the mode of interaction on, on some platforms 
um, tended to be acerbic. I just didn't, you know, like it. So I don't, I don't know a lot about it, but I, I can say that I know people who do engage on those platforms, scholars, um, professional and, and otherwise, who engage in those platforms, who enjoy it, who learn, who know things way before I know them <laughs> because they're all connected on these platforms and it, it furthers their work and enriches their work. And I think that having our work be accessible and visible to people who are not academics is a good thing. It improves what we do and maybe possibly it enhances what people are thinking who are outside of the academy on some of these issues. I have less to say than that. So I just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I'm a social media kind of, I mean, I have a Twitter account that I use on and I mean, I come in and out of it. I don't yeah. follow it obsessively and because, yeah. I only do it on my phone. That's kind of my trick. I'd never do it on my computer because my computer's for writing. So that actually allows me to, 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 to manage it. But uh, I think it's great that that more people are becoming interested in history. That uh, that the, you get more readers. You get more people engaging it. I think it. You're right. People, sometimes non-historians will weigh in or they'll start a debate about what you might not think is the most important thing. But that's just. I mean. I think that's just a that's that's just the reality of of working in this in this day and age, and I still think much more good comes out of it than than bad. More readers, more people thinking historically, is a great thing. I mean, maybe I'll add just a, a, a sub question to this. Um, not just social media, but also, I mean, I think every one of our panelists here have written, you know, for popular media in the sense of like newspapers, magazines, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, is it is it a different type of genre writing that kind of stuff? Is, do you see this growing out of your more scholarly work? <coughs> Op-eds, that kind of thing. Let me start because I, only because of the Kundal Prize people wanted me to write op-eds, I began to write op-eds. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and I discovered, hmm, I can write op-eds. That's it's a very dangerous discovery. <laughs> Uh, a leading question. <laughs> uh, well, you know, but it, I have a family history on this. You know, Histor you know, my grandfather was a historian under Stalin, and he learned in a very hard way that history can stab you in the back, he sting you like a snake. Mm -hmm. you know, and he was attacked for a book in 1948 that he wrote in 1944. And meanwhile, the eras changed, and he was attacked what he had written earlier and he lost all his jobs, and he was about to be arrested and all that. So when I decided to become a historian, um, my father, my, my grandfather passed away by that time, but my father told me, don't do it. It's one of the most dangerous business in the world. <laughs> you know, this is what I carried with me. But then I, of course, uh, inherited that fantastic uh, myth, not myth, but I said a great thing in, about enlightenment, uh, that uh, the Russian intelligentsia propagated for decades and decades, and I imbued it. And I thought, if only more people can think historically, at the same time rationally, not too passionately, mm -hmm. the world will be better. Um, so where I am now, it's, it's very hard to describe. I, know I, I certainly see it as unstoppable, as many people want to learn about history and want to talk about history. But when it happens, uh, I have trepidation and fear because too much interest in history means something not necessarily positive, but can mean anything. It can be also a premonition of some dangerous times to come because I, this somehow tells me that when people express their views of history, they don't read our books. They go to Nostradamus. They go to all kinds of other sources, to consp conspiracy theories. What we can do about it? We can do something, and this is why I stick out my neck against the advice of my grandfather and, uh, and write about these things. But we have to be really careful and be realistic. Uh, it's very hard to deal with, I would say, mass consciousness about history. Mm. It's very hard to deal with it. Not, it's, it's a serious conversation, maybe not for this round table, really. Again, you've given me a great segue. Uh, you just keep tossing that up. 
so we can slam dunk it. Uh, so historical arguments are, are often these days deployed in the service of politics, and politicians are often very bad historians. Um, what I'd like to ask you to do, if you feel comfortable doing it, is comment on a little on how you see this playing out in your field of expertise. And what do you see as the historian's ethical duty? Do you see it as the historian's ethical duty to correct the historical record when it's being used in the service of bad history? So I, I really have to say that this conversation is so interesting to me that I wish I wish we could slow it down, know. you know, talking about time and yeah. and you know open up all the comments a, a little bit more. Um, Vlad, what you just said about history can stab you in the back and it can sting you like a snake. I'm going to leave Montreal with those words, you know, uh, on my mind because I think that is partly what we're experiencing when it comes to a popular or a broadly public in interrelationship with history. Mm -hmm. People, and that includes all, all of us, we want certain things, you know, we desire certain narratives, we want to believe certain things about ourselves and about our, maybe our ethnic group or racial group or our, our um, nation of origin, our new nation of, of choice, and those are often positive things. And the past, can sting you like a snake, right? <laughs> so um, that's where the tension and the conflict comes in, I think, between the, the desire that we have about what history consists of and the reality that actually might exist in the archives and in the records. And it's trying to navigate and negotiate mm -hmm. that tension um, that is very difficult. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I want to just slip in here, too, that I don't really feel that it's an historian versus a non-historian kind of a, a conflict or tension or disagreement. I only feel like I'm half a historian, and maybe I shouldn't say this, you know, among Kundal Prize <laughs> finalists, but I have an interdisciplinary approach to the work that I do, and um, I feel that it is much literary and psychological as it is historical. and. There are many people who are not in ac academic positions or roles, who are very serious historians, who know much more than I do about um, even the topics that I write on. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think we can presume that um, that the, the public or you know popular readers out there kind of they don't know what they're doing. They're not reading mm -hmm. our work, and therefore they're you know mm -hmm. uninformed. We also need to listen to them and read their work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with, with everything that's, that's been said. Um, you asked about how, what, how this might be applied in, in our own specific field, so yeah. I don't know. I mean, um, I feel like, at least in the, you know, in the case of my field, I'm sure in the others, that it is important to have the voice of historians, whether they're academic historians or professional historians, but um, you, it, it's important to have good history uh, passionate, reasonable history, as, as Vlad said, be part of the conversation. And I feel like in the, in the case of Cuba right now, I don't know how much you, know, you all are following stories, but it's a really dire situation there right now. And in the midst of a dire situation, people make historical arguments or make certain historical assumptions that are very, very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so I think in a context like that, you need someone, not, again, not necessarily an academic, who can step back and, and tell that history in a way that, you know, that challenges that. Mm -hmm. uh, and to tell that history in a way that challenges that means that it has to be readable, that it has to be accessible, that, I mean, it not, not pandering or dumbed down at all, but just, you know, that it has to draw people in. And that in a world that is as polarized as it is, it needs to draw people in, in a way that makes them suspend mm -hmm. those automatic positions they're used to taking. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think the best way to do that is by writing history that is, um, that's human, that is, 
that that re that rejects the, the the impulse to just put things in boxes and in categories, and that you know allows people to see themselves in the story and allows them to see other people in the story in a different way, and and and, and so on. All I wanted to say, I, I applaud all this, but we have people like Vladimir Putin who weaponizes history. We had Milosevic in the past who weaponized Serbian history. And what can we do? You know, I had a personal shock uh, because I published the book in October uh, 20, uh, 2021 and in, on February 21st, uh, 22, um, Putin gave a speech where he almost literally quoted uh, my book. And I thought, it, could, it cannot be true. It, how he could get my book, read it, and turn it upside down. Because what, you know, he used the quote about Ukraine that I wanted to, you know, I wanted to use this quote as a demonstration of absurdity of that moment when the Soviet Union was falling apart and they were already thinking about the um, Ukrainian-Russian war at that time, some people. Uh, I thought it's utterly ludicrous. And all of a sudden, Putin either misquoting me uh, or just basically saying the same thing, but with menacing, sinister intention, which of course b became the war th three, mm -hmm. three days later. So, you know, I, I don't know what to do with all this. This is why I said when there's too much history, it can be misused in a disastrous way. But I, I'm all for reasonable, professional, <laughs> Good conversation passionate. and passionate, <laughs> non-violent, non passionate, reasonable conversation. If I can just yeah. reply to that a little, but then what is what would be the alternative? So Putin's going to misuse a quote, but uh, does, are, but you're still really glad you wrote your book, right? <laughs> Yeah, you know, so he would have found some some <laughs> else's else. somebody yes, else's yes, quote. Yes, yes. <laughs> he would have found something worse. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll 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 have a final question, which is going to go in a more lighthearted direction, maybe after some some very serious discussion. Now, um, a much more methodological question. All of your books are being considered for the Kundal Prize because of their enormous readability, uh, their ability to break down complex topics and distill huge chronologies for non-specialist readers. And just to give the audience a sense of this, Taya's book covers well over 100 years, Ada's book covers hundreds of years, and Vlad's book covers a few years, but they might have felt like several hundreds of years because so much messy stuff happened in those very short years. Um, so my question is, how do you tell very complicated and, and stories in, in a compelling way without sacrificing on details and nuance. How do you know what to leave in and what to uh, take out so as not to overwhelm the reader? Well, I think that the discussion just a moment ago already started to, to answer yeah. that question. I love Ada's language of telling human stories. That is certainly what I'm in it for, what I think we're all in it for. We want to contribute to you to the good of humanity and I think to the good of the world, you know, human and non-human and, and, you know, we do it um, through the ways that we have have come to feel committed to and have come to feel skilled in and that's through historical work. There's so many other ways that, mm. that you know, we might do it. I don't think there is ever a project that doesn't involve sacrifice, Christy. Yeah. I mean, we, we can't ever do it all and so some things do have to be traded in favor of others. And um, in the case of my book, which I really did want to write in a way that was very open-armed and welcoming to all kinds of readers, um, what I ended up doing was not starting the book with, I think, the 30 pages of colonial history that I had originally drafted. Because um, even though it seemed right to me, and it seemed chronologically sound, and it seemed to make perfect sense to begin um, in Charleston in the late 17th century. I thought that there were a number of readers, including my own family, who would go to page one and say, this is not for me. <laughs> and so I had to, to really rethink, how do I open this book? How do I open the doors of this book? So people will want to walk in, and then maybe I'll sneak in you know, I'll sneak in some of the earlier material later. And that's what I ended up doing. So, I mean, we could call that a sacrifice. I did lose pages in addition to losing 
and some detail in addition to losing the, the certain placement of um, events and time in the book. But I think that it is a real gain in the end, especially based on feedback that I get from people who refer to um, the very beginning of the book, which is which begins with um, a novelist, uh, an African American woman, a science fiction writer actually, uh, Octavia E. Butler, and then talks about uh, my family, and then moves into actually um, a, a 20th century figure from the family that I write about, and then finally kind of moves around to saying, and let's look at where this all began. I, as I was writing my book, I mean, I'm, I was trying to cover more than 500 years, so I, you know, I left out more than I included, I think. And as I was writing, I had, a, I kept a notebook with things as I realized that I had left out, but I might want to go back and include. So it was called mm. "Things I'm Leaving Out," <laughs> you know. Mm. Um, and I, so, so there is that that sacrifice. But I think that. I, I sometimes, when people talk about you know sacrificing detail or they talk about detail as extraneous, there can be obviously extraneous detail that's not necessary to move a story along. But I love writing in a way where the arc and the narrative is built through those details, right? So that the, the, the narrative itself is analytical and the analysis is driven mm. by the narrative. So it's not that there's an analysis and then there's an example. So that's what, that's how, I, how I've always tried to write. And so and it, I found it really fun, actually, to do it um, in this book. I thought it would, I, I love doing it. It was just a, a fun, in retrospect anyway, it was a really fun <laughs> book to write. <laughs> Well, I want to speak in solidarity with Ty and Ada. You know, histor some historians really are afraid to be writers mm -hmm. for some reason. You know, they go through all these stages, particularly when they're young, they have to you know, do check, 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 you know, all this fact checking and stuff. You know, but, you know, we all writers, and uh, this is again back to Plutarch. This is if, if we, if, if humanity will survive thousands of more years, will be read, not us, someone, because people will find it thousand years later as, as are related to them, right? Well written, well written. I think Thucydides is tremendous. You know, at least it was translated this way. Um, so, um, what does it say about how to write? And I found myself in a quandary because there are too many details uh, to to tell, particularly the Western reader. Why the Russians became so uh, so uh, vexed with Gorbachev at some point? Because you know you keep talking to the Westerner, and the Westerner does not uh, does not get it. The Russians get it automatically. So I came up with a metaphor of a hapless captain, and here you go. You have Ohab and Moby Dick. You have you know Hemingway, the man and the fish. You know the man who is on on something on a voyage. It's pointless how far you go. You should catch the big fish. And then it kind of resonates with, with people because, you know, we should read great books. Mm -hmm. We all love great books. And historians should always probably read great books every morning instead of, uh, you know, with coffee or without coffee. So I always had this image of, uh, from Gabriel Garcia Marquez, One in 100 Years of Solitude. It starts with Buendia standing in front of the firing squad. So every book should start with these great lines in a sense. What's in there that makes people uh, fight and die without fear of death? You know? Well, that is the end of my question. So I want to open up the floor for some questions from the audience. And I want to give you the caveat that I've promised them that they can go home to change before the next event. So I'm going to try to keep this to 20 minutes. So please make your questions brief. Does anyone have any questions in the audience? Yes. Can you stand up so it's easier to see you? Yeah. Um, Sorry, you're in the light, so I can't see you at all. <laughs> uh, thank you for your remarkable uh, and uh, discussion. And it, it sort of, uh, the, the first half uh, seemed to focus on where this passion bumps up against the person who's actually driving. And I wanted to ask about ego and what to do when you find it and what you have to talk about and how you that Big question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that question. 
Oh, oh, sorry, Christy, do you want to oh, repeat the it? The question was, what do you do when you encounter evil in your research? How do you deal with that as a topic? Mm -hmm. I appreciate that question um, quite a lot. I feel like my research swims in evil. Mm -hmm. And um, on the one hand, part of the process has to do with facing that and being willing to try to understand it. I really appreciate what Vlad said about how hard it is to take the opposing group or the opposing view of your history and to actually try to look at it or them with fresh eyes to try to understand them. I mean, it's part of our charge mm -hmm. to do that. And, um, and we must, which takes us to some very uh, dim places. And there's also the reckoning with evil that is the emotional and, and kind of um, the, the psychological part of the work, which can be very difficult to bear and I think it requires conversation and, and community and um, processing the work, as I was saying earlier, with others, uh, with feedback, not alone, uh, to help to move through those uh, shadowy spaces of the work. I definitely find myself asking all the time, how can people do this? How could they have done this? How could people be so brutal? How could people be so cruel? How could they sell their own family? How could they disavow their own children? And my only answer to that question is they have, which means that we have, because we are all one species. It means that we, we have the capacity for great wrong. And I feel that knowing that means that we have to make it a part of our charge as scholars, thinkers, writers, you know, artists, teachers, whoever we are, to try to redress that wrong in the work that we do. Do either of you want to weigh in or should I move on to the next question? Well, beautifully said, really, and very emotional, and I want to segue to this because my, my task was not to write about evil. My task was to write about Gorbachev and his entourage, who, whom I, I rooted incredibly at that time. And I thought they were the, the expression of goodness. And so did many people in the West. So my task was quite different. Uh, how could they do good things, or let's say bring, change Russia, change Russian people who had seen so much evil in the past? And, but well, let's say under Gorbachev, there were all, all kinds of evils, but not on Stalin's scale, not on Hitler's scale already. Mm -hmm. But then I was, follow, I, I was following Gorbachev and sort of seeing him trying to uh, be good through nonviolence. Yes, I understand it's Gandhi and all these examples in the past, and I see him failing again and again and again. And I was so emotionally affected, it, but a couple of times I really almost threw my laptop against the wall. Well, no, I, you know, it was, was just emotional reaction. How you can do it without using force against at least some bad people. Okay, why are you doing it? He was a man of principle, I guess. This is in part why he failed. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I feel I, I, there's evil all over my book. You know, there's there's this, the the conquest. There's uh, tremendous, uh, you know, almost unspeakable. Un, well, unspeakable violence against uh, indigenous people, dispossession. There's the evil of slavery. So it's, I I feel like it's it's everywhere in the book. So the question is how to, you know, your question about how to redress it or how to how to address it and redress it, uh, because the I don't think the book would work as history if all we did was po point out to the evil and call it evil and, and, and leave it there. So part of it is understanding it. And part of it is understanding life's, lives lived in the shadow of that evil, right? So it was evil, but that was where, you know, how people lived with that evil day to day. And so shining a light on how people live. So just uh, there's an, uh, th the example that came to mind right now was a, a story set in the, a, a chapter set in the 19th century on a, on a Cuban sugar plantation that was owned by, actually by a Rhode Island senator who was also a slave trader uh, and who had 
you know, who at one point was um, uh, tried for murder of a woman he killed um, on a slaving voyage. And he owned, he and his family owned six plantations. They lent out their torture instruments to neighboring um, plantation holders. But reading letters um, from visitors to the, um, to that plantation, I came across this one mention of the way that uh, enslaved people in their quarters used the light of glowworms as candles. So mm-hmm. it's, just, it's just like a, literally a, like an ember, right? But it, it, it takes you into a, a space where people living in that evil aren't defined by that evil, right? So I think that's part of how that's part of how we do deal with it. And then the other part is that when I got to the part on the Cuban Revolution, again, where opinions are so polarized, it's I almost had to because out there what you have is two sides calling each other evil, right? And what I tried to do there was really to just kind of step back and get people and again I keep coming back to this, but it was so important for me, get people who might be in opposing camps, to at least for a moment understand why this camp was doing this and why this camp was doing this, right? The, like trying to get people. And again, maybe it's just futile, and there's Putins who are going to do whatever they want with their history, but, but, but trying to get people to see, to see a shared moment through the eyes of other people living in that shared empathy. moment. Empathy. Yeah, empathy, yeah. Oh, it's not futile. It's not yeah, futile because not. For, for every Putin who might be misquoting, you know, for the purposes of evil, there are people who we may not see, may not know, who can use the work to shine a light, you know, in, in their moment of chaos or distress. Yeah, I love that language. Yeah. 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 Another question? I saw another hand before. Dead silence. <laughs> you have reserved questions. Bob. Oh, I, 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 my reserve question was was sort of, um, but in some ways we've we've touched on it already. But, um, but I would love to hear your thoughts on this. You know, what what distinguishes public history from popular history? That was my my other follow up question. Do you consider your books to be public history or popular history? That was my follow up question. Mm. Oh. That was all I was going to say, maybe both. Or neither. They can be neither. Again, maybe in a typical example of growing up in a society where so much was regimented and and under censorship, but so much about the past could not be published. And what's what's so interesting, not only uh, I had to endure the, the whole book about the history of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union with only two names in it, um, <laughs> Lenin and Brezhnev. And a- a- everybody who acted inside the party in between, they had been murdered, of course, but we were not supposed to find their names. So it was dehumanized to an absurd degree. And the absence of passion, the absence of kind of emotion was there. And as a result, all of a sudden, not immediately, but in the 70s, when things began to mellow, this so-called popular history mm-hmm. emerged where some writers began to write history about Catherine the Great and her lovers, you know, Potemkin and, you know, whatever. And all historians kind of frowned on them and denounced them, which increased their fame. Only because nobody cared about those historians who, you know, right. wrote those boring, <laughs> boring books. So, in a sense, for me, it becomes an indicator of popular history becomes sort of um, a sui generis only when we uh, professionals uh, do not do enough. Maybe mm-hmm. so we have to address the public because history is a public affair. This is what I guess all of us would agree. Uh, we uh, we address demos. We address, you know, what Thucydides wanted to enlighten people in ancient Greece. We, we, we try to do the same, you know. So it's a false dichotomy, maybe. Well, I, I agree that history is a public affair. I think we all agree. Probably many of us in this room agree. We may 
We probably do have our own individual working definitions of public history in comparison to popular history. To my mind, public history references an actual field of historical endeavor, which uh, involves applying historical research and investigation and writing and interpretation to the needs of the public, you know, uh, in the public sphere, in relation to um, professionals in various walks of life from governmental agencies to community organizations to museums. It really is about engagement with communities and collaboration, and there's a whole professional ethos connected to public history. Mm -hmm. Popular history, to me, is really what, what Vlad was beginning to describe, um, the kinds of books that are written for popular audiences and perhaps with topics that were selected because they are known to be popular in advance. I think of uh, the Marvel movies and where everything's a sequel because they know that people will come see it because they've already seen it. It's just a different slant. So uh, we get, um, in the U.S., we get a lot of popular histories about U.S. presidents and yes, I'm sure they were very important. They were very important. Okay. Yes, they were very important. <laughs> but I think that those are the kinds of topics that people know will sell. And um, these narratives are oftentimes not especially analytical. Mm -hmm. um, they're there to, to inform people, but in a way that is very, I think, enjoyable for the reader. Mm -hmm. I will say that um, even though I don't tend to write those kinds of histories, I sometimes read them, especially when I'm on vacation. And, and, and you know, I, th I think there's a place for all of it. If it's responsible, methodologically, there's a place for all of it. Yeah. I mean, I think that the way you laid out the difference is, is, is perfect, but I wonder why our books wouldn't be, I mean, wouldn't be popular history. That, of course, they're, they're different in that they're based on deep archival research and, and we're professionally trained, but I think, you know, we like it that people enjoy reading them so does is that enough to call them popular history and one of the one of the things that has most surprised me that or that I just didn't expect with this book is all the emails I get from people and they're mostly many of you know they're Cuban Cuban American Latino who have never who haven't read much history before and they read this book and they want to you know they want to gift it to their aunts and their grandfathers and you know I th that's popular history but maybe it's for maybe those people aren't reading the David McCullough's and the you know the the biographies of all the presidents. So, so I think yes, they are they are they're too discreet. We think of them, and they are two discreet bodies of work. But I don't think I think we can define them in ways that are we can engage them in ways that are more porous. I think. We have time for one more question. Is anyone if anyone is so inclined? Yes, Jerry. Hi, um, I have a follow-up question regarding the debate about public history and uh, uh, popular history. So I'm thinking like whether, uh, what is the relationship between uh, history and memory? So especially individual memory and uh, public memory. Um, because I've noticed that uh, mm. Uh, it's easy for me to, to to answer it because I I wrote about something that happened 30 years ago, and uh, still, when I began to write, many many people are still around. So I was fortunate to talk to to many. I talked to Gorbachev, and he put his arm around me, and he said, "Young man, look at this guy Yeltsin. What is he doing to Russia?" 
So, you know, I could feel his passion. I f could almost feel his hatred for Yeltsin, who pulled Russia from under him and destroyed the Soviet Union. But having said that, uh, I still, I, I, I'm still glad that I, I've written this book 30 years later. In, in a sense, it's like a middle crisis, midlife crisis of public memory, because people already are so much ingrained, encased in, 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 in what they believed they experienced. Mm -hmm. They told so many times to their children and then grandchildren what they did back and whatever. Uh, so when someone suggested to me later on, go and interview Gorbachev, I knew it, you know, I wouldn't do it, not, not, not to waste time, because Gorbachev said about the same thing so many times that his memory became uh, like you know, a mortar, sort of. Mm -hmm solidified, it was impossible to break it up. You know, some people tried, they mm -hmm. failed. Even before he died, he didn't open up. So I think memory is a whole you know, totally amazing dif different subject that psychologists, sociologists, historians, whatever, they, they explore. But you know, in, in some cases, when you want to write about uh, a recent event, you have to be really careful with this memory, in my uh, my friend was a diary. I I love diaries, and I read many diaries, and I used diaries in full understanding that whatever a person wrote could be highly subjective and highly selective. But still, in, in very rare cases, a person could get back and doctor his or her diary. Well, sometimes it happens, uh, but diary already is there. You know, it's, it was written in 1991, for instance, and in 1990. So there are all kinds of uh, tricks and all kinds of methods to deal with memory, but you know, we'd, we'd better have a <laughs> another forum first. Yeah, when, when you ask your question, I immediately thought of the famous Howard Zinn line that history is the memory of states. So that's mm. one way to, to look at um, both history and memory. And I think for all of, you know, all of us here are, are writing a you know not history as the memory of states right so uh, constructing other other kinds of of histories out of other kinds of other kinds of memories I think in in my case because again the the Cuban Revolution is so contentious and it's in it, you know the, the conditions of Cuba right now are so hard there is um, history and and memory cast the last sixty years as one thing. Right, and so when people complain, they say, "Oh, this has been like this for the last sixty years, or this is this sixty years, sixty years." And it's the, the so the the current popular historical narrative uh, is is constructing a collective memory of of the revolution that is very very ahistorical, mm -hmm. right? So um, so par so I think part the part of what I saw myself doing was writing. Um, not not against in, in the sense of confrontation, but writing in ways to disrupt what I see as an emerging collective memory of the revolution that I think is is deeply deeply ahistorical. So I agree with with what's been said, and I also appreciate the question because it is tricky sometimes to disentangle memory from history. They're not the same thing. But they overlap and they they uh, abut one another often, and especially in projects where um, the focus is on marginalized peoples or groups who didn't have the opportunity, the wherewithal, um, the respect to keep his, to to create and to keep historical documents that are uh, oftentimes the focus of histories, we have to rely on memory. But memory is, as Vlad was saying. Um, it's it's highly subjective. I think of memory as more of a psychological process. I can sit here and remember what happened to me last week, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be accurate or it would stand the test of historical method. I bet if we went and looked at my calendar and my receipts and uh, what other people had written down about what I did you know, um, last week, that we would see some discrepancies. So um, the two are different, but but related and often rely upon one another. 
Well, with that, I'm going to uh, draw the forum to a close. I want to give a wholehearted thank you to our three panelists, Taya Miles, Ada Ferrer, and Vladislav Zubok. Uh, tonight, oh, <laughs> thank you. And, uh, and tonight we will find out which of our three panelists will take home the 2022 prize at the Kundal History Prize Pressful uh, Gala, which will happen in a couple of hours' time. So thank you very much for coming. This has been a great discussion, and, uh, and really, I think it could not have gone better. So thank you to our panelists again. Thank you.